my name is Callum. Um, I lead the backend team at Luxo. Um, we build a lot, well, all of the backend services, which are um, powering some of our D apps and um, user experience that you use uh, with Universal Profiles. Um, this QR code will take you to my link tree. Um, it's got Twitter, Discord, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, also, my GitHub. Uh, that's it. If you look in green, you can see what I've been working on the, for the past uh, year. If you look towards the end there, the end of October, start of November, you see it gets kind of busy, and um, we've got a lot of bright green squares. Um, and that's because last week we launched um, Universal Profiles officially on the Luxo mainnet. Um, so yeah, that was a big uh, milestone in the journey of Luxo. Um, a lot of effort from a lot of different people. Um, so it's a, yeah, a good one to celebrate. And maybe some of you have already played with Universal Profiles before. Um, Stephen and Johan introduced them uh, this morning. Um, for those who have not already tested it out, you can go to uh, my.universalprofile.cloud, create a profile, install the browser extension, and um, yeah, test it out. All the gas is subsidized, so you can really, uh, there's, no, there's no risk unless you start sending funds and stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I will do a third introduction of Universal Profiles very quickly. Um, so um, a Universal Profile is a smart contract-based account system, um, which we have developed at Luxo. Um, this is a screenshot from our browser extension. Um, and as you can see, this is a, a blockchain-based account, but it has a lot of um, Web2 features that we're used to um, from Web2, like Facebook and Twitter. So we have a profile picture, a username, background image, these sorts of um, personality features, which um, we don't really have anywhere else in the Ethereum space. Um, so we have this verifiable profile metadata. All of this metadata can be fetched directly from the smart contract itself, and the assets are stored on IPFS, but, if, but you can retrieve them just by querying the smart contract. So it means that any dApp which wants, can pull in this information um, of this uh, universal profile and display it um, correctly in a kind of nice decentralized way. Um, there's also a fully upgradable permission system, so you can have individual um, and scoped keys. And depending on what, uh, what you want to do, you can have keys with different permissions. Um, it's entirely up to you. And we'll come back to that um, in, a, in a moment. Um, also, the uh, extendable key value data store. All of our standards at Luxo are based on the ERC-75 standard. Uh, this allows you to store uh, key, key store data on smart contracts in, a, in an upgradable way. So you can have data which evolves over time, you can have um, some value stored at some key, and you can change that key later. And that... Hello. Do we have a backup? Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, we should probably plug it in. Um, yeah, okay, so all the standards we do are based on ERC-75. It gives you this upgradable smart contract. Um, you can, you, okay. So you can change the data over time. Um, so, and that's what enables us to have this profile metadata where you can change your profile picture, username. So you, it's not like you're stuck with whatever profile picture you choose at the beginning because that would be a disaster. Um, so, and we can also have gasless transactions. Um, as Stephen and Johan mentioned this morning. So, okay. Um, we, we are able to actually subsidize all of the gas at Luxo. So when you come to my.universalprofile.cloud, you can deploy a universal profile, and you don't have to cover that gas cost. We cover the gas cost for you, so it means that you can come. You don't have to go and get the native to token of Luxo to be able to start using, start using universal profiles. Um, and at Luxo, we have developed our own suite of standards, which we call LSPs. It stands for Luxo Standard Proposal. Um, it's a, equivalent to ERC in the Ethereum, in the Ethereum space, it stands for Ethereum Request for Comments, but this is Luxo standard proposal. And a universal profile is really just composed of lots of different um, LSPs, which come together to give you this cohesive application. As I mentioned, everything is based off ERC-725, which is this upgradable key value store. Um, and I'm just going to do a very quick fire round of all of the standards involved in a universal profile. So we have the LSP0, that's the blockchain-based account. LSP1 is a token receiver hook. This enables you to be able to react when you receive some, um, receive some value. Your universal profile can um, perform some action in an automated way. We have the profile metadata. This LSP5 is a received asset standard. This lets you uh, query the smart contract directly to see which assets this universal profile owns. That, so we don't need to rely on um, third-party uh, indexing services like OpenSea, which is what currently happens in, um, on Ethereum and the rest of the space. Um, we have LSP6 as an upgradable permission system. LSP12 is a way of retrieving the assets that the Universal Profile has created. 
And we have LSP14, a standardized way of transferring ownership of the universal profile. LSP17, a standardized way of adding extensions onto the universal profile. LSP20 is a way of um, standardized way of interacting with the profile. We have LSP25, gasless transactions, and that's not actually even all of them. So the point of that isn't to, for you to memorize that. There's a lot of <laughs> too much information. The point is just to illustrate that really all of these features are just individual components of um, a larger application. So we can think of universal profiles in these two different ways. The one is um, the conception on the right, which is how a user is going to see a universal profile. It's a complete application um, with all these different features where you have connections, controllers, profile metadata. But as developers, we can think more in terms of, um, on the left, of these individual standards, which can, be, um, can themselves all be leveraged in different ways. So depending on what your use case is, you can do um, different things with these different standards. And by thinking about the universal profile as a collection of standards, we can um, hook into things in more interesting and sophisticated ways and start breaking it apart and um, experimenting. So that's kind of the, the preamble of uh, just the introduction of what I wanted to talk about. Um, this talk, I'll go over three real use cases where it looks so we um, have used universal profiles in some of our uh, applications. Um, these aren't made up, these are very real and we, um, very real cases where we decided to use a universal profile over using a private key in an application because of the benefits it gives us. So it sort of illustrates to developers that we are you know, eating our own dog, dog food and we are actually using these things and working with it. Um, so the three, the three um, projects which I'll discuss is the Luxe to Lux migration. Uh, maybe some of you have used that already. There's the Universal Profile Recovery Service, which we launched last week and the Funder Universe Profiles, which you will not be familiar with because that's internal only. So that's a bonus. Okay. Um, so yeah, to start with the Luxe migration. So the goal with this project is we wanted to create a simple and easy way to migrate Lux E tokens from Ethereum mainnet to the Luxo mainnet. In 2020, um, Luxo um, officially launched with the reversible ICO and, and Luxo um, was able, did the RSCO, so um, people were able to stake Ethereum, and in return, they got Lux E. And Lux E is the representation of the Luxo token on the Luxo mainnet, but it lived on uh, Ethereum mainnet. And it means that um, developers and people were able to obtain the Luxo native token before we actually launched our mainnet, which launched several years later. So when we did launch our mainnet, we had to create a bridge so that people could migrate their tokens from the, Luxo, uh, from the Ethereum mainnet over to the Luxo mainnet. And um, we launched this in July um, 2023, so earlier this year. And uh, we're currently approaching uh, 7 million Lux that has been migrated through this system so far. And of course, this is a very high stakes project. There's a lot of money traveling through this. Um, so it's very important that the Lux which we use in it is secured safely and is not going to be compromised by anything. Also, it needs to be resilient to any malicious migrations. So we don't want people to be able to spoof a migration and be, to be able to basically take more native Lux on the Luxo blockchain than they should be able to. It should correspond exactly with the Lux E on the Ethereum mainnet. Um, so maybe some of you have used this service already. Um, it, yeah, I'll just give some quick, a bit more information about what was actually going on behind the scenes. Um, we basically had a, a front-end UI where you could go and it, the UI would encourage you to deposit your Lux E on the Ethereum mainnet to a deposit contract. So that's you. You send your Luxe to the deposit contract. The deposit contract then emits a deposit event. In EVM, we have events which are firing um, when certain actions happen. And these events we can actually hook into to perform functionality. So we had a back-end service which was running and it was listening for these deposit events which was being emitted by the deposit contract. So every time there was Luxe deposited to the contract, amazing. Hello. Yes, thank you. Um, so every time there was Lux E deposited to the deposit contract, there would be one of these events emitted. And that means that our backend service can actually hook into that and react to that event that comes from the Ethereum blockchain. So every time one of these deposit events is emitted and the, backend, uh, the, the migration backend receives it, that it triggers an equal Lux token transfer on the Luxo mainnet. So each uh, deposit of the Lux E corresponds to an equal transfer of Luxo on the Luxo mainnet, and it goes back to the user who sent the original deposit. Um, so uh, the way that universal profiles fit into this, and we used universal profiles here, is we actually 
um, had a universal profile which was sending all of the Lux uh, on the Luxo mainnet to the users. So this was called the Luxo migration universal profile. You can see the address is 0x1111, um, contract name, and the balance here is 600,000 um, Lux. And this was actually the contract which was sending the Lux to the, to uh, to the users as they migrated their Luxe from the Ethereum mainnet. So the, we had a migration backend which was triggering these token transfers for the profile. So why did we decide to use a universal profile to do this? Why did we not just use a private key? And the reason is it's mainly safety. Um, using storing funds on the universal profile gives us a lot more safety benefits than just a simple private key, as I will explain. So um, yeah, as you may have seen this morning, um, the universal profiles, we can have multiple controller keys which can control different aspects of universal profiles. Um, so here, this is uh, the browser extension. In the controllers tab, you can see this universal profile has three different, different controllers. This is just a stock universal profile. This isn't the migration universal profile, but just to illustrate um, how it works, each of these three controllers is able to control different parts of the universal profile, so it's these scoped permissions. And which permissions you give a particular key will depend on what you want to use that specific controller key for and what the purpose of that key is. So in, um, in the case of the migration uh, service, which we ran, and the migration universal profile, we had two keys which was controlling the, the profile. We had one, which is this transfer key. This is the key which the backend uh, service had, which was, using, um, which was triggering all of the Lux transfers in the, from the migration universe profile to the users. And we had a second key, which we can call a lockdown key. And this was a, a safety mechanism that we were actually able to build into the universe profile itself um, to, to protect against, uh, well, losing tokens. And the way that this worked is this lockdown controller um, had different permissions. This lockdown controller was not able to send any um, locks. It wasn't able to actually trigger a transfer, whereas the transfer token was. The lock lockdown uh, controller could only edit the permissions of other controllers. So in the case that something went wrong and the backend service, we detected some, uh, some fishy activity, we can actually lock down the whole system. And we can automate this. So the lockdown key just locks the migration universal profile. No more um, tokens can be transferred. And it's an entirely shut down. And this gives us a lot of safety, because if we were just doing it using um, a private key, that would be totally impossible. If the private key got compromised, everything on it is gone. Whereas here, if, something, if some, something fishy goes on, we can actually lock down access in this kind of automated way, and we can kind of build applications around the functionality of universal profiles to give us this added security. And just, I want to kind of uh, yeah, emphasize this point that Everywhere in computing where we're using private keys and secret is best practice and it's always advised to rotate private keys. But in the blockchain space, we're always told and like we're actively discouraged from rotating private keys, which is kind of like absurd when you think about it because it just goes against everything in, in the rest of, of computing where we have to rotate private keys because the longer you use a private key, the greater the risk that that key gets compromised and over time it becomes less safe. So this is why you have people terrified to do anything on the blockchain because they think they're gonna get hacked or, or, or anything. But with universal profiles and these controllers, because the universal profile address stays the same, it's possible to upgrade and actually rotate the private keys which you're interacting with. So you can actually implement proper uh, best practice security by using universal profiles. Um, so the, yeah, universal profiles allows these kind of on-chain safety mechanisms which are just not possible uh, by using private keys. And um, so yeah, with any, with any network, any network bridge, any token bridge where you're transferring value from one chain to a second chain, there's always going to be an off-chain component somewhere in the system. The two networks can't actually communicate directly, so you need something which is running off-chain to coordinate those token transfers. And this is a weak point in the process, because as soon as you go off-chain, you lose all of the security benefits that the blockchain gives you. So to sort of mitigate this and lower the risk, we can use universal profiles, and we did use universal profiles in, in, in this case, to, um, to add additional safety checks so that before sending any value, there are actually some checks happening on-chain to make sure that that, that transfer looks, looks correct. Again, this wouldn't be possible if we were just using a private key. So, as I mentioned, the way that the uh, migration system works is we had a back-end service which is running off-chain, which is reacting to these deposit events, and that triggers the Lux transfer. 
And before triggering the Lux transfer, um, these, the way that we implemented this mechanism, the migration backend actually has a private key in it, a second private key. Which is no, this is not a controller of the universal profile, but this private key is used just to sign the deposit event, just to sign the content of that, of that event, say, OK, I've received this event. And the, the signing proves that it is the migration backend which is actually has received it. And then when the migration backend instructs the migration profile to send, um, send the locks to the user, they send that deposit event and the signature. So, oops. And the migration universe profile is actually able to verify um, in that way, the migration backend's identity. The universal profile has a list of allowed addresses, um, and the signature, the recovered signature from the signed deposit event, needs to match one of the addresses that's in that list. And if it doesn't, the migration UP just won't transfer any funds. So in this way, the responsibility is transferred somewhat onto the migration universal profile, so we actually have on-chain security for this. If, again, we were using a private key, the migration backend would be responsible for all of these checks. So that would make it a lot more weak and much less secure. Whereas now, if the migration backend or something, or there was some, some um, malicious actor who's trying to spoof um, transactions, even if they were to obtain the controller private key of the universal profile, they, it, they wouldn't be able to do anything and they wouldn't be able to transfer funds because they didn't have the second key, which is signing the deposit events. So it enables these multiple layers of security built into the smart contract itself. Um, and so by leveraging the LSP6 and ERC725, um, it gives the universal profiles much more um, security than using the private key. Um, so, yeah, that's the migration profile. Let me drink some water, and I'll go on to the second one. Delicious. Cool. So, um, second project, universal profile recovery service. So. Uh, with, this, with this project, um, our goal was to create a secure and simple way uh, for users to recover access if they lose, uh, lose access to their universal profile. Um, this is new technology. Uh, we sort of expected that users would lose access to their universal profiles when they start using them. So we wanted to provide a way that would be easy for users to recover access if they needed to. Because if, if, yeah, if, the loser, if the user loses access to the controller key, they're locked out of their profile, and they need a way to get back in. So we wanted to uh, provide a solution for this. And the solution um, we implemented was using, again, universal profiles. So maybe some of you have used this system before. You might um, have some experience. It, basically, the, the, the flow of when, we're, when users deploy universal profiles, they'll be asked to actually set up recovery on their, on their profile. And then that's using this universal profile, which we call a recovery universal profile. There's 10 of these we deployed, um, and I'll show how they, yeah, how they work and how they actually grant users access. So during the deployment flow, um, the user deploys their own universal profile, and they'll be asked if they want to opt in to recovery. If they choose yes, they sign up for the recovery, they um, enter their recovery information, which is uh, email and two-factor authentication on a mobile device. Then they'll be asked to actually add a new controller onto their universal profile. And that controller is this recovery universal profile. So here we have the user's universal profile, and there's these two controllers, which is the user controller, which is uh, the the controller of the browser extension. So that's the controller that the user is using. And then there's the recovery profile, which is the backup. So if the user loses access to their profile, they can no longer use their own controller. They've, locked out, they've lost access, they're locked out of their profile. But there still is access there via the recovery universal profile. So the user can go to our platform, enter their recovery authentication methods, and then the recovery profile is able to send a transaction to add a new controller to their profile. And this way, the user can regain access um, if, if they lose, if they didn't have any sort of backup of, of the browser extension controller. And this is obviously, it, it's quite, I mean, it's high stake. We need this um, recovery universal profile to be very secure. Um, because being able to add a, add a controller to a user's profile is a, a, it's a high, um, high risk, let's say, because we don't want, if the recovery universe profile got compromised, 
then the, uh, the person who was hacking the recovery profile would be able to add a, re a new controller on every profile that used the recovery controller. So to make this secure, we actually wanted to have a multi-sig um, setup. So we wanted to have a, a universal profile which could only be um, instructed to do recoveries by uh, having multiple keys. And universal profiles don't natively support multi-sig uh, transactions. There are multiple controllers, but it's not multi-sig in the sense of having multiple signatures that contribute to one transaction and one action on the blockchain. Um, so to do this, and what we did is um, we leveraged a feature of universal profiles, which is the LSP6. And the, one of the, the cool things of LSP6 is the controllers on your universal profile don't have to be private keys. They can also be other smart contracts. So we were able to use a Gnosis safe as a, as a controller of the recovery profile. And that way, every recovery transaction which is being executed requires multiple signatures to, to actually be invoked. So we have these, these guardian keys, which are used to sign, um, sign the Gnosis safe transaction, which instructs the recovery profile to recover a user's profile. And these um, guardian keys we can actually we stored in different locations, and we worked with a or we are working with a registered custodian. Um, they're registered in Germany, and they are they are responsible for um, for some of these keys. And what that does is that spreads the risk of this system. It means that there isn't one single point of failure because we don't have one key that if it gets um, lost could could um, yeah rub people's profiles. So yeah, again, just to yeah, reiterate, this is basically um, leveraging the power of LSP6. Um, you can go very far with LSP6 and does this really complicated things um, if you have these custom setups that you want to do and hook into. And the third project um, is the Funder UP. So this is a bonus. This is an internal, um, an internal thing that we use, again, just for, for ease of use. Um, it's not a public feature. It's just for in our internal development. It makes things easier. And the goal was to have a safe way for us to um, transfer Lux around to some of our internal projects. So some of our projects will require Lux um, on them. So for instance, we have a relay service, which has keys. And all of those keys need tokens to be able to do their job. Um, so we as developers need to be able to actually fund those relay keys. Otherwise, it has no keys and we can't manage the gas. But when we're transferring lots of money, we want this to be, do this in a safe way. Um, but we can't be totally dependent on anyone in, at the foundation to be able to transfer these funds. We need to give some power to our developers to be able to take responsibility for these. So our developers can actually manage the balance of the relay keys and top them up as necessary. So um, this is our solution for this. We have uh, the FNCE Relayers Funder. This is a smart contract, again, a universal profile. The balance is about 7,000 lux here. And this is used to exactly solve this problem because the Funder universal profile is able to transfer lux um, to specific addresses and only those specific addresses. So if uh, a transfer was attempted for, to a different address, an address that wasn't in the key value store, then that transfer transaction would just not go through. And that means that um, we can actually give power to our developers because our developers can control controller keys and manage controller keys that are controllers of this funder UP. And that means that they can manage the balance because they're able to send the balance to the private keys um, when they see fit. And we no, don't have to risk our developers running off with the, the foundation's luck supply. And it means that yeah, developers can have the power to actually manage, the, our, manage our projects. And again, this wouldn't have been pos possible if we were using private keys, because that would be a lot more risk. Because as soon as you give someone a private key, they have access to everything on that. Whereas here, in this case, we were using a universal profile. And that universal profile could only send funds to those very specific addresses. So there was no way to send it to my personal <laughs> address, for instance. So, yeah, that's, um, that's sort of it. I know that's very quick. It's a lot of information. The, the goal of this talk wasn't to, um, 
it wasn't so much instructional. I don't expect anyone to go away and implement these things. It was more to demonstrate actually the power of what universal profiles can do. Um, and actually, if you start digging into this stuff, how much functionality can be built into the universal profile itself. And it can actually be incorporated into larger applications by hooking into these different um, features. Um, and yeah, here, the, the main two features which we used was ERC-725, which is the key data store, and LSP-6, uh, which was the controller permission setup, which allowed us um, extra, extra safety. So um, yeah, I mean, we're, as Stephen mentioned, we're at a good phase right now where we're really looking for developers to come and start building. Um, we're really, the launch of the Universe Profiles is really just the start. Um, we have a, lot, a long way to go of improving Universal Profiles and building new applications. Um, so the best place to go is the, our documentation. We have uh, good developer docs. We have nice guides on Universal Profiles, the standards. Um, the guides there are, are more uh, introductory guides will teach you how to start using Universal Profiles in your code and start developing with them. We also have a hackathon which is ongoing. I think um, there's a few weeks left, so there's still time to put a project together and submit that. Um, this QR code's here if you want to scan it. Um, and yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>